I'm Sarah Barth, Executive Director of Semper Virens Fund. Thank you for joining us for another of our Under the Redwoods webinar series in which we explore the beauty, history, science, benefits, art, and inspiration of redwood forests. Um, we wanna thank Sharf Investments for their sponsorship of the Under the Redwoods webinar series, and also to thank Heritage Bank of Commerce for their additional support for this specific episode. Semper Virens Fund acknowledges that redwood forests in the Santa Cruz Mountains are among the ancestral lands for many indigenous peoples who cared for these lands for millennia until they were forcibly removed. And we are grateful to be working today with their descendants, including the Amamutsun tribal, Amamutsa tribal band and the Mwakma Ohlone tribe to restore some of their cultural and traditional relationships to these magnificent lands. With that, I'm going to turn to uh, our speaker. And when we think about climate resilience, which we've talked a lot about with this audience, we've often talked about wildfire, heat, drought, uh, and more recently in our region, flooding. Um, but it is without question that water is one of the dominant uh, impacts on the landscape that we care so much about, both impacts for good and bad, and that, and that that is being changed as a result of our changing climate. And so I'm so pleased that we have here today our speaker, Erica Guys. She is the author of a great book called Water Always Wins, Thriving in an Age of Drought and Deluge, which sounds like it almost could have been written for our region, but unfortunately is applicable to much much of the world actually, but certainly much of the Western United States. She is an award-winning journalist and a National Geographic explorer. How cool is that? And she's written about water, climate change, plants, critters for a number of esteemed publications, including Scientific American, Nature, The New York Times, The Atlantic, The Guardian, The Economist. And she told me just before we started, she has a new story coming out in our own local Bay Nature magazine. So with that, I am delighted to invite Erica Geis here to speak with us and to tell us about uh, her thoughts and her what she's learned about water and how it impacts um, people and nature. So thank you, Erica. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And it was so great hearing about um, the expansion of Castle Rock. Um, I grew up not far from there and went there as a kid. Um, so it's so good to hear that uh, you are protecting that area and, and expanding the protected area. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Are you able to see that? We are. Okay. Uh, all right. So as, um, as you were saying, Sarah, uh, you know, climate change has been amplifying the water cycle and we're seeing more extreme floods and droughts all over the world, including in California and the Bay Area. And one thing we hear a lot is that infrastructure isn't built for these extremes or isn't built for climate change. But in fact, um, infrastructure is actually part of the problem. I'm going to try to turn off the closed captioning because I'm finding that it's distracting me a little bit. Um, let's see. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, infrastructure is actually part of what's making these water extremes so disastrous for us. So I'm talking about urban sprawl, industrial agriculture, logging, and even the very concrete control-oriented way that we try to manage water. Um, all of these land use changes have really pushed natural systems to the brink, including the water cycle. And they are a big part of the reason why our uh, attempted solutions to these problems are failing more and more often. Um, so I traveled around the world in researching this book. Um, I went to uh, Washington State, China, Iraq, Peru, Kenya, England, India, Vietnam. And in all these places, I felt I met people who are innovating a different way to relate to water. And one group was um, this woman uh, who I met on the Mesopotamian marshes of Iraq. Uh, she is a marsh dweller. And um, 
she is part of a 9,000 year old civilization, um, a culture that has lived in harmony with water on top of the water um, for, for all this time. And so it really pushed me to question the basic assumptions that we have in dominant culture. And by that, I mean kind of Euro-American culture that's been exported around the world via uh, colonialism and capitalism. And that is seeing water as either a, a commodity, if it's scarce, or a threat, if we're worried about flooding. Um, but that is not an innately human way to look at water. In fact, there are many cultures around the world, uh, cultures that live closer to the land, indigenous cultures, um, these marsh dwellers, uh, who instead see water as a friend or a relative. Um, the marsh dwellers, uh, and this is between the, the cradle of civilization, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, they really see water as the source of all life and everything that they need. Um, and so this tall grass, this is Phragmites australis, it is their major building material. As you can see, that house on the right has remained unchanged for thousands of years. Uh, this culture became the, the famed Sumerian culture that invented writing with cuneiform. Um, and all around this area, many, many famous civilizations have risen and fallen, including many that used irrigated agriculture. Um, but eventually they fell and the marshes retook their land. And uh, I have to think this is uh, their community center that is also built from that uh, marsh grass. I have to think that the way that they relate to water, their respect for water is a big part of why their civilization continues uh, when many others do not. Um, and, you know, I'm not suggesting that we all live on top of water, um, but I think there's a lot to learn from that, that uh, different attitude, different approach. So, you know, in the dominant culture, when we have flooding, when we have droughts, we tend to hear calls for more infrastructure, more control, higher levees, bigger drains, longer aqueducts, desalinization. But, you know, because we push this natural water cycle to the brink, these systems are brittle and they're failing increasingly often. Um, and it's really kind of a single focus problem solving solution that we bring to these things. You know, if we need water, we build the dam, we bring it from somewhere else. If we're worried about flooding, we build a wall, we build a levee. Um, but it ignores water's complex relationships with soil and rock and microbes and beavers and humans. And in ignoring those complex systems, um, they weaken them and undermine them. So systems theory, thinking about these complex systems and how all the pieces work together, which I'm sure is a common idea um, for this audience, given your interest in ecosystems, um, is why when we try to control water, uh, it instead contributes to flood and scarcity. So just to give a few statistics, when I say we've dramatically interfered with the water cycle, we have actually filled or drained up to 87% of the world's wetlands, dammed and diverted two thirds of the world's large rivers. And just since 1992, the land area covered by pavement and cities has doubled. And so all of these ways, um, we're destroying these natural uh, systems that would absorb floods naturally, move water underground. The surface groundwater connection is really, really critical, uh, especially in the West for supplying streams in the dry season. The, the water feeds those streams from underground. And, you know, historically, a lot of streams in the West actually flowed year round, but now we tend to think of them as only seasonal, but that's because we have destroyed this water cycle. <clears throat> um, so wetlands and other slow water phases also store carbon dioxide at a rate higher than a lot of forests. They uh, support biodiversity um, more than many other ecosystems, freshwater ecosystems. Um, they actually generate rain they clean water. Um, and so for all these reasons, the approach that we need to take now is to make space for these slow water phases to return. Um, and a lot of the people I met in my book, uh, these are engineers, scientists, landscape architects, urban planners. They're asking a different question that doesn't center humans. They're asking, what does water want? 
And what I came to understand is that what water wants is a return of these slow phases that we have eradicated with so much of our development. So slow water is similar to the idea of slow food in that um, it's unique to its place. Every slow water approach seeks to work with the local geology, biology, and culture rather than try to control it. It's ideally local, understanding the local water availability and working within it. Uh, it's socially just. Um, our standard water infrastructure is an, actually an environmental justice issue. I think people are familiar with the idea that if you have a wall, if you build a levee on a river, you are um, blocking it off from the floodplain. So you're raising the water level within the river, and that increases flood risk on other communities who maybe can't afford a levee. But dams are also an environmental justice issue. There was a really interesting um, meta-analysis globally that found that dams brought water to 20% of the world's people, but decreased water availability to 24% of the world's people. So, you know, it's not magic water. It's coming not just from other ecosystems, but from other people. Um, you know, our standard water management tends to be centralized. Uh, slow water solutions are distributed across the landscape. And that makes sense if you think of all the places along water's path from mountaintop down to the ocean where it used to slow. We need to make as much space as possible for it to do that again. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes you will hear that ideas like this nature-based solutions are nice, but they can't be a significant part of the solution. And that is really a question of scale. You know, if you think about the scale of the size of our reservoirs, I mean, they're absolutely massive. And so, of course, if you're daylighting, you know, a thousand feet of creek in, in a city, that's not going to be enough. But if you have all of these small projects scattered throughout, um, every little bit helps and it's cumulative. It's kind of like how solar panels on everyone's roof adds up to a lot of electricity. <laughs> I'll say that, sorry, uh, we've had some smoke in this area in, in Southern Canada where I am right now. I think it's, uh, it's been getting to me. Um, so these projects are also often community facing. So in our current system, uh, water is handled by experts. And um, a lot of these slow water innovations are uh, either community driven or community facing because they're scattered across the landscape. People are coming into contact with them and either managing them directly or um, if experts are still handling them, maybe there is like educational signage, which explains what's happening uh, with the land and water in that area. So these are some basic concepts about changing the culture of our relationship with water. And I'm just gonna go through a few of the examples um, from my book and some of my other reporting that illustrate uh, them. I wanna start with Kenya. Um, this amazing kind of Dr. Seussian landscape is at 13,000 feet elevation um, at a mountain in the top of Kenya. And this is the source of almost all of the water that serves Nairobi, which is the capital city of about 6 million people. And, um, you know, there are various uh, physics reasons for why uh, mountains attract water and rain and then um, feed it down, um, which I won't go into in detail here. Um, but having this area covered in its native vegetation also plays a really important role because these plants carve space in the soil that allow the water to move underground. The plants um, transpire, they kind of exhale the water, which is another part of how the rain forms and accumulates with um, other moisture that is coming up from below and hitting the mountain. And um, Basically, Kenya has a really forward-thinking water management program which seeks to protect water towers like this as the source of water for all Kenyans. Um, they, they are considered the water generators, and then people down below are the water users, which I thought was an interesting, um, interesting analogy. Now, below these grasslands, um, starting at around eight or 9,000 feet, 
Um, there are different forests. There's a bamboo forest, then there's a rosewood forest, and then there's this kind of forest, which is about um, a kind of a mixed montane forest, 6,000, 7,000 feet, which also help to keep that water flowing. Um, but with population growth, which is happening all over the world, a lot more people are moving into the highlands and cutting trees to practice agriculture. Um, there are programs to, you know, have the agriculture happen underneath the trees, um, but there are also programs to help protect these areas and allow them to reforest and introduce alternative livelihoods for people. Um, so I'll just say that there's a lot of emerging science, which I'll be uh, writing about in a new nature journal called Water, uh, about this connection between forests, uh, water, and atmospheric water cycles. So forests, when they transpire water, that creates local rain, which is called the small water cycle. So if you deforest, you also are drying out your local water supply, your local rain. Um, on average, rain over continents, about 40% of it comes from plants and trees. Uh, it can be as high as 80%. Uh, so it's very, very important. And I think, um, and then also uh, this water contributes to the atmospheric water cycle. So there have been studies that show how the Amazon is connected to rain in the Midwest or the Congo is connected to rain in Europe. Uh, and so that's another really interesting facet of this. And there's been talk of international water sharing agreements uh, for rivers, of course, but now there's talk of atmospheric um, sharing, which is an idea that, you know, it's important to care for your own land because it might be threatening someone else's water supply. So there's a lot more I could say about that. Um, but I'll just say that it's conventional wisdom in Kenya that when you cut forests, you lose water because people in their lifetimes have seen deforestation lead to springs drying up and they've seen reforestation lead to the reemergence of these springs. So, um, and the last thing I'll say about this is that tree planting is uh, having a bit of a, a moment. Um, when people think about nature-based solutions, they often think about planting trees. And of course, there are carbon carbon offsets and things like that. Um, there's been a lot showing that the accounting is wonky, um, but also that these replantings are not often long lived. And that's because so often people are planting plantations of really fast growing trees like pine, even if they're not native or eucalyptus. It, without any consideration given to their role in the water cycle or their role in the ecosystem. Um, so that's a problem, but also, you know, you have a plantation all the same age without the mixed uh, ecosystem, you have a lot weaker system. So it's susceptible to forest fire, it's susceptible to bugs. Um, increasingly what people are finding is it's best to let trees replant themselves. Um, in a lot of ecosystems. And so that money that is going to the tree planting could be used to protect the area, um, to make sure that it's not damaged uh, by human activities, and it can go toward alternative livelihoods for people who were relying on that area. Um, and so, or, or also like um, pulling up non-native plants to make sure that there's space for the native plants. So anyway, that's also complex, but I will move on. Um, this was a project in Seattle, Washington. Um, and I think, you know, um, in California, we see a lot of uh, streams that look like this, uh, actually all over uh, developed countries. Um, and, uh, you know, the majority of urban streams are actually buried in pipes or filled in with dirt and covered, but the ones that remain at the surface often look like this. And it basically uh, went through this process of like cutting all the riparian trees, Flooding increased, people were worried about that, so they straightened the river. Uh, then the water became fast water and started gouging out and eroding everything. And so then they you know, put the concrete at the sandbags to stop the erosion. So it's very much that like single focus problem solving that just causes another problem and another problem and another problem. And ecologists call this urban stream syndrome and it's marked by flash floods, unstable banks, heavy pollution, and very little life. So there was a creek in Seattle called Thornton Creek. 
uh, that was flooding the local area pretty frequently, a road, a school, people's homes. And um, so over about 20 years, the public utility started buying out willing sellers to make more space and also to protect salmon, which are endangered um, as they are in California. Uh, so a lot of urban stream restorations have involved, you know, kind of taking out the concrete, um, putting in more of the natural meanders, putting in some wood and boulders to make it look sort of habitat-y. But um, what people were finding was that these systems did not maintain themselves. Um, they needed a lot of ongoing maintenance. And in fact, the life that was in them was not very diverse. It was sort of like a, a crows and cockroaches situation of the uh, aquatic landscape. So um, a biologist who worked for the city uh, named Catherine Lynch realized, you know, it's not just the stream that we see on the surface, but there's a stream underneath, which is called the hyperreic zone. And that means underflow. Um, so this is not the aquifer. Um, it is an ecotone, an in-between zone. So water moves down from the stream through it. It moves up from the groundwater. And it's also flowing downstream in the path of the water, but orders of magnitude more slowly because it's moving through all the soil and rock. Um, and so she realized like all of this scouring had probably eroded most of the hyperreed zone, which is sort of the soft material at the bottom of the stream. Um, and so she thought, well, like, well, what if we try to recreate that? Maybe it'll be a healthier system. And it's kind of like, um, you know, we've been learning a lot about our gut microbiome and how if that's not healthy, we're not healthy. The hyperreg zone is like the streams um, gut microbiome. There's all kinds of critical nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon cycling that happens in these areas. Uh, it's the source of a lot of food, um, oxygen. Um, it's actually where salmon lay their eggs. So if there's no hyperreg zone, it's going to be hard for them to do that. Um, and so they decided in a first in the world attempt to rebuild a missing hyperreg zone in an urban stream and to repopulate it with the missing critters. Um, so the first thing they did is they started with historical ecology. And this is something I saw in a lot of the projects I looked at. Basically, people try to figure out like, what did water do here? What does water want? What was water doing here before we dramatically changed it? And so they map from historical records where streams flowed, um, you know, where the wetlands were. And the idea is that, you know, water wants to go where it wants to go. And so it's likely to return to these areas. And in fact, they discovered that the reason this area kept flooding is because it was an historical floodplain. And so they were actually, this is an 11 mile long creek. Um, and their project was only 1600 feet. And the reason it's been so successful, and, and it was successful, um, is because of that historical ecology. They made water, space for water in the place where water really wanted space. Um, so they added a lot of gravel and sediment. They carefully placed the wooden rock. They did all this modeling. And, um, you know, it was pretty ex inexpensive, um, the hyperreic element, uh, just a fraction of the project's budget. Um, and because this was the first ever thing, um, the city required that some scientific studies be done to see, you know, if it was working the way that they intended. And um, they found that water was moving down into the hyperreg zone, that physical movement, um, 89 times more than before they did the project. Um, like I said, they had to introduce critters from a wilder stream, little mi micro critters. Um, because as one of my sources told me, if your headwaters are a Home Depot parking lot, <laughs> you know, it's unlikely that, um, those insects and other tiny animals are going to be in the river at all. So they can't just like float downstream. Um, so they did this inoculation and then they did, um, some, some surveys, some sampling to see if they had survived. And they found that, the restored sections had seven times more crustaceans, worms, and insects, and much greater uh, species diversity. And then the last thing they looked at was pollution. And so urban streams are really, really bad um, for pollution because there's all this really super fine dust 
um, on our pavements. And when there's a, a storm, it just like rushes off and it all lands in the creek. And so they first analyzed the water. They found more than 1,900 pollutants, which is pretty common. It's like lawn fertilizers, brake pad dust. And then they looked at, okay, does spending time in the hyperreak zone clean the water? And they found that water spending three hours in a 15-foot stretch of the hyperreak zone reduced 78% of the chemicals by at least half. So it was a really, really remarkable finding. And, you know, this is non-point source pollution. It means that, like, it's not regulated at all. Uh, it just goes into our waterways. Um, so anyway, this has been a very successful project. Um, the city has not flooded since they built it. <laughs> it's a beautiful park. The neighbors love it. Kids come and get education there. The stream flow is more consistent year round because that water from beneath is healthy. And Chinook salmon returned and actually spawned in this hyper zone that they had created. So I tell you this story because it shows how complex these water systems are in ways that we probably don't know much about or don't think about. Uh, and so it shows the importance of making space for these natural systems to function, especially when we don't understand them because uh, it's pretty hard to replicate them. I will briefly talk about beavers. Um, my Bay Nature story that Sarah mentioned is going to be about California's new beaver supporting program. Um, interestingly, so beavers are native to North America and also Europe, uh, and they were almost um, pushed to extinction by trapping. They were actually completely gone from the UK for more than 400 years. And now people are really supporting their return um, for two reasons. Um, one, they help store water, they help slow water on the landscape um, and are huge supporters of biodiversity. Um, you know, many, many other plants and critters rely on beaver created habitats, but they also um, slow flooding, which I think is a little counterintuitive to a lot of people because people think, well, beavers cause flooding by damming things up. But in fact, it's sort of like um, flattening the curve during the, the coronavirus pandemic um, where, you know, people masked or, or isolated uh, to try to keep levels down in the hospital. Similarly, um, the beaver dam, the same water goes through a beaver dam is porous. It just slows it down. So it's going downstream over a longer period of time. And so it's less likely to flood those streams, <laughs> sorry, those towns. So in the West, um, people are much more interested in beavers uh, for their ability to hold water, particularly as our snowpacks melt. Um, we're getting more rain in the winter and then you know, we whisk it away to the ocean like we saw uh, during the um, atmospheric rivers this winter. Uh, but beaver dams, because they're slowing water, they help to hold that water um, on the landscape longer. So, um, this picture of the parachuting beaver is actually from the mid 20th century. California's attitude toward beavers has kind of run the gamut from killing them to relocating them uh, for their water health benefits to killing them again and now protecting them and, and using them again. Um, so a researcher in Washington found that when he relocated beavers um, to different areas, their first year, their ponds stored 75 times more water above and below ground uh, per 100 meters than areas without. Um, and so in a rain-dominated basin, this could increase summer water supply by 20%. Um, and so historically, beavers lived all along a stream. And if you have those... Um, it kind of extended beaver systems, excuse me, that can be a really um, powerful fire break. And there's a researcher uh, in Southern California named Emily Fairfax, who's done a lot of work about beavers and their fire protection abilities. And basically, you know, they're rehydrating the landscape. It's not just that water doesn't burn, that the ponds aren't going to catch fire, but also because they're raising the water table across a wider area, um, the nearby plants have more access to that water. And so they're, they're healthier, they're less dried out and less likely to burn. 
So that's just one way in which um, restoring landscapes can help restore the water cycle and protect us against both drought and fire. Um, I'll briefly talk about uh, tidal marshes because uh, the Bay Area has lost about 90% of its historical wetlands, um, including tidal marshes. And um, the rivers that start in the Santa Cruz Mountains and elsewhere among the redwoods, uh, a lot of them do end up down on the bay. And there's a very important relationship um, between those upland ecosystems and the tidal marshes. Um, so sea level rise has already, California has already seen about six inches. Um, the state predicts that it could be as much as seven feet by 2100. Um, and so what's really incredible about tidal marshes is that they can actually keep up with sea level rise if they have enough time, space, and sediment. Now the sediment comes both from the, the mud flats and the bay onto the marshes, and then it also comes from upstream, from the streams and creeks. So a lot of that sediment, we're having a, a sediment scarcity problem right now. Um, and part of that is because um, the streams, a lot of streams have dams or various flood control structures. And so that sediment is getting caught behind there and uh, not making it out to replenish the, the marshes. Um, and so it's really important um, that we look for opportunities to kind of make those systems more natural, to free that sediment. There's also a lot of dredging that happens for shipping. And um, historically, there was a problem with people dumping that sediment to build more land to fill in the bay. Um, and so there were some environmental protections to stop that, which involved dumping that all out in the ocean. Now people are realizing, hey, we really need that sediment. And so um, there's been some work on the state uh, regulation level to try to figure out, okay, can we make sure the sediment's clean so that we're not, you know, introducing pollutants? And then how can we deliver it to the marshes so that we're not killing animals that live in the tidal flats and things like that? So sort of a work in progress, but a lot of people have been restoring the bay. You've probably know about like the cargill salt ponds that have been restored to marsh. That's part of the work that's happening. Um, but there are a lot more opportunities that people are looking for to restore as much marsh as possible <laughs> to protect the Bay Area from sea level rise. Um, this is uh, an historical marsh. It's about 13,000 years old. And you can see all the different colors. That's very slight differences in elevation, um, which mean like different plants grow there because there's different levels of salinity different birds um, nest on different plants. And it's also better for um, flood protection than the newer marshes because it's so varied. The slight differences in elevation, in fact, slow the water even better than a newer marsh that would be created now. Um, so that's just the importance of protecting what we have. That's like the first line of defense and then restoring what we can. And when this area is free from human-made barriers, uh, like roads or development, then the uplands um, can connect down to the, 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 the lands and all of these water and nutrients and sediment are um, sort of in exchange with each other, which is really important for their functions. Um, this is a salt pond on the right and a newer marsh on the left. You can see how it's a lot more even looking than the, the um, historic marsh that I showed. Um, and I'll just say that um, wetlands are super stores of carbon dioxide. They can store three to five times more carbon than a lot of forests. And they can increase their carbon storage rate with sea level rise if they don't flood too quickly. So, um, Another thing is people are still proposing developments right along the coast. There was one that was recently um, defeated in Redwood City, right on the water. Th there are various problems with this. One is like, we need all the protection. Well, first, if you're building something right on the coast, it's gonna be more susceptible to sea level rise itself. So you're putting more people in harm's way. Second, 
um, that is space that you're taking away from the water. So you're increasing flood risk everywhere. So I'll just say, you know, it's important to vote <laughs> against these things. Um, there was one other thing I was going to talk to you about, but I think we might be getting a little short on time. Um, okay, I'll just do it really quick. So this was a story I did for Popular Science about um, Southern Arizona and Northern Mexico, like dryland areas that had been you know, deforested, grazed really hard. Um, and so now there's massive erosion because the water just runs right off. And there are um, indigenous interventions um, on uh, both uh, Arizonans like Hopis um, and uh, native groups in Mexico that have traditionally built these various interventions like one rock dams, leaky weirs, et cetera. And the idea is to slow water within the system. And they have actually um, increased like wetlands in these dryland areas. Um, and in water scarce places, people tend to think like, oh, they're holding on to my water. And landowners who tried this heard that. But a scientist at USGS did a lot of research on these systems. And she found in, in this paired stream study that the treated stream actually was producing 28% more water. And it's because that water was lingering and slowing and not immediately evaporating. Um, so that's just to say that in water scarce areas, we tend to have the scarcity mentality, but in fact, taking care of water systems also takes care of us. And these types of interventions could also work in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, and there are people in California who are talking about headwater streams and the things that we can do to make them healthier again and to help um, reduce erosion and to support uh, their own slow water systems. This is a picture of the treated stream. And um, I'll just add, this is my book. Um, which has a lot of these stories and this kind of basic philosophy. It also has um, a long reference section in the back um, if you're interested in learning more about the specific studies that I'm citing and the work. And really, you know, there's a growing body of research that shows that these types of interventions work. Gray infrastructure has a 150-year head start, and so people tend to default to that because that's what they know. But in fact, um, these systems can work and um, they're scalable. You know, you can start small in your own community and build from there. So I just encourage you to think of this kind of radical shift in our relationship with water and how to support that in your community. And also, I think, you know, our economic system is also single focused. Like if you're worried about flooding <laughs> and you build a levee. What's the cost benefit analysis of that? How much are you spending? How much is that going to protect? But it's often not counting the negative up against that, right? It's not counting the other community that you're causing more damages to. It's not counting, um, you know, the carbon that you've lost from ruining that wetland or that floodplain. It's not counting um, how hungry the fish are because they don't have the food on that floodplain. Uh, and so that's another thing that we can advocate for in our own communities is that kind of more robust accounting. And um, the Biden administration recently followed up on a UN proposal to um, account uh, this in, in the accounting for, for federal projects. So that's something to look for. <clears throat> and this is my website, slowwater.world, um, where you can also learn more about these ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. This was just amazing. And I really encourage people to read your book and even just Google you to see some of the many articles that you've written about a variety of topics. Um, I feel like this work is really, really important. And you and I discussed earlier that Semper Byron's Fund, you know, started originally as an organization that was primarily focused around these charismatic redwood forests and over time has grown more and more sophisticated in understanding that the forests are not in isolation in any way, shape or form, and that we need to be dealing with the various species that inhabit them. We've 
engaged with fire. And we have in more recent years really gone much more deep in working to restore some of the um, uh, riparian systems uh, that are on uh, the lands that we own in particular, where we have the ability to, to do very active restoration projects, including things like removing a dam and um, reintroducing large woody debris to support salmon and natural restoration of gravel flow throughout the streams, etc. Um, but listening to you and reading your work has made me realize that there is a lot more that we could and should be doing. And so I wondered if you have any guidance to us about things that you think could be really applicable here in our region. And I was joking with you at the beginning of um, before we started the webinar that I feel like we need to start a beaver reintroduction program in the Santa Cruz Mountains on our properties, but it's not a joke um, in the sense that there probably are a number of things additional to what we already do that could benefit the, the, the local and beyond water cycle in our region. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to open up the conversation to give you a chance to respond with any thoughts you might have or guidance advice yeah. encourage us to to think about well um the beaver question is really fun uh i think a lot of people are are fond of beavers and actually they have been in the santa cruz mountains in the Los Gatos creek watershed since the early 1980s i discovered which was really surprising to me because i grew up in that area and i did not know that they were there until i started reporting this recent story yeah i didn't know they were there <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's kind of a fun story um there was sort of this lore going around that um california department of fish and wildlife had brought some beavers a couple of employees had brought some beavers um, from the Delta to Lexington Reservoir above Las Gatos yeah. um, in, I don't know, like the late 80s, early 90s. And so I started looking, you know, trying to track that down. And um, there was some, a lot of people had heard that story. It was pretty hard to prove it. But I did talk to various people who had seen beavers in Lexington from that area going forward. <laughs> and so there was a lot of a lot of uh, first eyewitness evidence that they were in fact there, regardless of how they got there. Yeah. And then I met a guy who works for Valley Water, which is the utility uh, based in San yeah. Jose. And he has worked for the utility since like 89, 90. And he told me that in fact, um, the people who manage the Alameda flood control channel uh had had beavers move in there in the early 80s from uh the big rains that happened during mm -hmm. that time and they didn't want to they didn't want them there but they were afraid to kill them because they were afraid of public outcry and so they were having a conversation with some friends at the valley water board and uh that guy was like oh hey you know i i know a guy who lives up in the santa cruz mountains who would probably be open to putting the beavers on his stretch of the creek and so they did that um and this guy i talked to at valley water jay abel he actually met the landowner who was like yeah that was me that I, I brought the beavers and he also met a guy from uh you know animal control in santa clara valley who had relocated the beavers so he had like kind of double confirmation of that story and the beavers were actually released up near um i think it's called El elsner dam which is like above lexington right at the kind of headwaters of Las Gatos Creek and the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, and so then, then the beavers moved down. And um, as early as 89, this guy, Jay Abel, saw them in Vesona, which is a park right in the heart of Las Gatos. So um, anyway, I was pretty excited to hear that beavers were already there and for, you know, what's that, like 30, 40 years? Um, yeah. So, um, you know, seemingly well established. And then in, in my research, I found they're actually in five of the nine Bay Area counties. Um, so, you know, they're here and the more that we can make space for them. And part of that involves like um, changing our infrastructure. So the way, you know, beavers and people both want to control water. Uh, humans, at least in the dominant culture, tend to want fast water, tend to want to speed water off. Beavers want slow water. Um, so yeah. we're a little bit at cross purposes and our infrastructure that tries to create fast water ends up being particularly prone to 
uh, beavers, uh, in, you know, changing that. Um, and so, you know, you can make, instead of putting your creek in a little pipe, you can have an overpass in a much wider area. Um, that's just one example. Um, and then there are various, like San Francisco Estuary Institute has done a lot of research on historical ecology of different stream systems in the Bay Area. And they make suggestions for places where um, we could potentially return streams to more natural paths. And that kind of thing makes space for, for animals like beavers as well. Um, and I'll just add that like a lot of the streams in the Bay Area are actually controlled by the utilities. Like Valley Water has jurisdiction over Las Gatas Creek and over Guadalupe River in San Jose. And um, so, you know, they do things like, I, I, I don't wanna like cite Valley Water specifically, but utilities do things like um, using pesticides on native species like tule reeds or cutting native species like willow trees because they don't see the river, they see the rivers as water infrastructure, as channels, as opposed to natural habitat. So that's another way that we can try to work with um, people in our own community to expand our uh, understanding of what waterways should be and what they can be. And, you know, places that have managed to restore parts of um, their water systems within cities have wonderful recreation areas. I mean, we see that in the Baylands, right? Um, those yeah. where now we have a lot of access to water and they can really help with flooding. Um, I did a talk in Colorado Springs earlier, which is obviously less <laughs> populated and built up than the Bay Area, but they do have development pressure and they prioritized protecting this kind of vast floodplain along their local river there. And um, they had huge rains over the winter and the city did not flood. So it was a really impressive performance. Um, sorry, I got kind of on the beaver tangent. What, uh, did, did I answer the rest of your Yeah, I think so. so. I mean, I think throughout your talk, you've spoken of things that it's good for us to be considering more deeply how we protect these forests and our communities by protecting these watersheds and which which is something we've known for a while but I think the this concept of slow water supporting groundwater recharge um the 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 zone that you discussed under the river in Seattle these are all ideas and approaches that I think we as an organization and our many partners probably could be doing a better job of as well as just educating people like through this talk um, of the importance of managing water in ways that will reverberate in terms of local rain among the many other things. So um, yeah, you've given us a lot of food, <laughs> food for thought. The, yeah. the other thing I wanted to follow up, up with you on is the issue of indigenous knowledge and indigenous approaches to water management. We have organizationally a good history, I think, um, in recent years, last decade or more, of working with uh, tribes in our region around forest management, uh, prescribed burning and cultural burning, and a lot of, um, we have learned a lot. And, but but water is not something we have really spent time with them on. We've worked with them on restoration of anadromy in our region, but it hasn't been the kind of examples that you've given. Um, and I wondered if you could just say more about how that's worked in other places, give some examples of how indigenous knowledge has been useful in restoration of, of water systems. Mm. Yeah, I like to I, I like to make that point about the dominant culture because the way that we relate to water, the way that we think of water is not innately human. There are many yeah. cultures around the world that have a different perspective, including um, many indigenous groups in North America and in California. And I think it fundamentally it's like that separation between humans and nature that we have in the dominant culture where we think that we're different and better than nature. <laughs> Whereas many indigenous cultures who live close to the land understand that we are part of nature, which of course we are. Um, yep. And one thing I think that's really interesting about that, understanding water as an entity with agency that has rights, which is why I ask, like, what does water want? Yeah. Um, 
there's a sense of with right come responsibility. So, you know, in the dominant culture, it's all about what can water do for us, you know, like right. we need it, we want it, we are going to make money off of it. Um, we need to be protected from it. Whereas in a lot of these other cultures, there's an, more of an understanding of these complex systems that water operates within and understanding that you have to ensure that those systems um, are maintained and functioning if you want to continue to get what you need from them. Um, so a couple of places that I looked at that in depth were Peru and India. And um, I know we're getting close on time. So uh, I'll just briefly say that um, in Peru and the Andean um, highlands, they also have like a, a short wet season and a long dry season. Yeah. And so historically, they would uh, divert water from streams in the wet season into these natural infiltration basins, again, working with that groundwater connection. So once the water moved underground, it moved much more slowly. And then <clears throat> they would pull it um, out of the ground or like harvest it from springs where it emerged. Um, closer to their fields uh and because so many of so many modern peruvians live in urban areas uh at the foot of these mountains them taking that water and watering their crops then it moves back underground again and into the river and then supplies um the cities into the dry season and so there's a national plan uh policy in peru that requires water utilities to invest in these upstream systems there's the yeah. recognition that natural infrastructure is infrastructure is part of what we need to supply our water um and so some of this money is going to help restore some of these systems that have fallen into disuse um among other things and then in india um all across india in fact where you have the monsoon and then long dry seasons um people had innovated different ways of working with their particular landscape my story in the book is from Southern India, um, Tamil Nadu, uh, which is um, in, in the city of Chennai. And they have a, a 2000 year old system there called eddies, which is basically um, a series of connected pools from the top of the mountain all the way down. Um, some of them are uh, attached to streams. Um, so like when a stream runs heavy, that can absorb some of the flooding. Uh, in areas where there's no surface water, they're connected to each other, so they help infiltrate and raise the groundwater level. And in this way, um, you know, they were able to, uh, you know, feed themselves year round despite having uh, unusual water. So, and, and anyway, that was lost somewhat during the colonial period. And now that they're having a ton of problems with uh, both flood and water scarcity, they are um, sort of rediscovering that culture and restoring it. Yeah. Back to the future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm dating myself. Um, well, Matt, I want to <laughs> I want to uh, see if we have time for a question from or question or two from the audience. Yeah, thank you. We have lots of questions and, and sure. reactions. Um, one uh, one of our guests is familiar with the concept of sponge cities. And um, I was wondering if you could just say a little bit about what they are and whether massive flooding events that have been begun to uh, occur are are over overwhelming even sponge cities yeah i write about sponge cities in the book um and it basically the idea is that uh cities are largely impermeable um with asphalt and concrete and so water that falls uh doesn't sink into the ground it instead runs off very quickly causing flooding and then because we're worried about flooding, we rush it out of the city and then we don't have it for later. So it also contributes to water scarcity. And so the idea of sponge cities is to make cities more permeable. And that can mean um, like restoring an industrial area along a river to a flood plain slash park. It can mean like green roofs, permeable pavement, bioswales, all kinds of uh, spaces that allow water to infiltrate, ideally with native plants. Um, now China has the most ambitious, like a lot of places are doing this around the world, including the United States where they call it low impact development. <clears throat> China has the most ambitious national program because the president Xi Jinping has supported it. Um, and it's expanded to 500 something cities. These cities are absolutely massive. Like in the United States, I think we have 11 cities that have populations of more than 1 million. China has like 
125 cities with populations of more than a million. So these are absolutely massive cities. Um, the sponge city component typically has been, you know, still in the pilot stage, like maybe five square miles. So if you have made five square miles somewhat permeable, like 70, 80% permeable, which is their target, but your city spans a thousand square miles, it's not surprising that it's still going to flood. And the reason China has seen this massive increase in urban flooding is because it's seen a massive increase in urbanization. Like in 1980, only about 20% of Chinese lived in cities, and now it's like close to 70%. So these cities have just boomed, and that's why there's been this big increase in flooding. So in short, I think sponge cities can work. I think it's just not yet at the scale. Um, so it, yeah, it needs it needs to be the the main feature, not not a a side idea. Thank you. I will uh, try to get one last question in. I um, wondered uh, one of our guests wondered if um, some of the best practices you're seeing might align with. Um, traditional indigenous ecological, you know, practices and strategies uh, for caring for the land. Absolutely, um, because uh, these systems, when they work best, make space for natural processes. And I think, you know, we've had a real arrogance in the dominant culture of thinking that we can control nature, and obviously we can't. Um, and we, I think some of our interventions have worked so far because the population hasn't been that big. Um, but, you know, it's more than doubled in my lifetime um, from three and a half billion to more than eight billion. So we're just running out of space. You know, we've actually altered more than 75% of the land area. So we just don't have that buffer of natural systems um, to protect us anymore, which is why we're seeing our systems fail more and more often. And I am encouraged by um, like I'm living part of the time in British Columbia right now where there are a lot of indigenous groups, um, and here and in California and elsewhere, you're really seeing the visibility of these groups. You're seeing like the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, where governments are, um, agreeing to treat indigenous groups as co-governments and like actually listen to them. Um, you know, they're starting to teach their languages to their kids again, restarting some of their cultural practices like potlatches and dances in the big house. And um, so that's all to say that I feel like people are mainstream, dominant culture is like more aware of indigenous people, their connection to the land and the, the wisdom that they have to offer and more open to it. Um, but I think there's still a very, very long way to go. All right. On that note, <laughs> I see that we are out of time. But Erica, I just want to thank you for joining us, for writing this book. I really encourage people to read it. You can learn, uh, you can find information about it on our website. I think it was put in the chat as well. Um, and uh, we will have to have you back because you've inspired some really important thinking, I think, for us about how we can um, better work to support the human and other natural communities in our region um, with some of your ideas. So thank you. And to our audience, thank you for joining us. Um, appreciate you hanging in as we went over a little bit. And I hope you'll join us next month for a webinar with Jane Kim. She's an amazing artist and science illustrator, and we'll be able to describe a project that we're working on with her to help um, educate the public about redwoods and tree rings and all that you can learn from it. So she's, she's amazing. Join us next month on September 26th. And thank you again, Erica, guys, for joining us and for your expertise and your work in this area. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye.